Remember, last week we did not get finished in the chapter, and I'm always way behind where I plan to be, but that's okay. I have fun. I hope you do too. I love to go on tangents, and so again, if there are any tangents you want to go on, uh, you can just chime in there, and Casey's going to let me know if there's anything that, uh, or any questions that you might have. Uh, Mark chapter 3, what we've seen is Jesus healing on the Sabbath day. And you'll remember last week that there are these religious experts who were concerned about ritual rather than relationship. Uh, they were concerned about abiding by the traditions rather than the law of God. They came to church one day, and Jesus was there and preaching, and, and uh, they... they uh, they criticized him for healing a man with a withered hand. And uh, you'll remember that in that conversation, uh, Jesus then indicates what's lawful and right to do. And he saw this as a way of freeing this man up on the Sabbath day, rather than allowing him to stay in his position where he was laboring all the time with a withered hand. And just a different way of looking at it. Again, many people look at ritual. Jesus looked at relationships. That is not to say ritual is bad. I love ritual. But if it's empty, we don't need that to bind us up in our lives. We find that the crowds follow Jesus in Mark 3, and we see them coming from all over Israel and even outside of Israel because they want to see Jesus as the teacher. And, and uh, when people came to him, he healed them all. Imagine being a part of that and seeing people with no legs standing up or people who couldn't see now being able to see with new eyes or people with leprosy that were healed or whatever the illness was, Jesus healed them. But when the impure spirit saw him, they shouted to him. These were the demons that were um, binding people up and they cried out, you are the son of God. They were recognizing him for who he was. I think we ended last week with looking at uh, even a scripture from John 1 in, the chap in John chapter 1, Jesus says to Nathanael, you will see the spirits of God, the angels, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, which was him. And so Jesus was making a point that he is the one who creates the angels and sends them out. Well, these are now angels that have left their proper habitation and have come to disrupt and destroy the world and hurt people. And no wonder they cried out, Son of God. Many places will find them saying, what, do you, what have you to do with us now, knowing that the day of judgment is coming for them? But Jesus cast them out, and then he gave them strict orders not to tell, the demons, not to tell, to be quiet, not to say that he's the Son of God. And we ended with the question, why would Jesus say that? It's an interesting theme in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus says that, because, this is what I believe, because the question, who is Jesus, is the question everyone must answer for themselves. Not only just each person, but all of creation must answer that. Is he the Lord of the cosmos, all creation? Or is he just a great teacher or a prophet or something like that? And these demons recognize that he is the Son of God. Now, there are four different ways that it's used in the ancient world. The term, benai Elohim in Hebrew, the Son of God. Uh, the angels are called Son of God in Genesis 6. The nation of Israel in Hosea is called the Son of God. The king of the nation is called the Son of God. You'll find that in 2 Samuel 7, where God says to, about the king, I will be his father, he will be my son. And also we find in ancient literature in the book of Sirach, which is not in the Bible, it's an apocryphal book, but it says the good man is the Son of God. When the demons call Jesus the Son of God, what they are recognizing is he is the link, he is the good one. He is the Holy One of Israel who can connect heaven and earth he is the one who appears before God and can stand before God. And so the Son of God is the one who is closest to God. We find out that he's not just close to God, he is God, that he is that close. In the bosom of the Father is John, the Gospel. We use the language that they are one. Or in John 14, Jesus says, when they ask, can we see the Father? He says, have I been with you so long you still don't recognize me? Right, that was last week. This week we're going to take a look at verse 13 and see Jesus uh, uh, collecting the disciples. Remember the word disciple comes from the word discipline. This doesn't mean bad discipline, to beat someone down. It means to raise someone up, to disciple someone. To, uh, and so we'll find the disciples of Jesus will be numerous. But he's going to select certain ones he'll call to be sent out. And the word to be sent out in the Greek is apostolos. That's to be sent. Jesus will say that uh, he is sent from the Father. And now he gathers together a community that he's going to send out, the apostles. Now there, there's a difference between what we call the apostles. They're known as the twelve. That is actually a term that's given to them. So even when Judas Iscariot hangs himself, they're still called that group the twelve. 
you know, that Jesus appeared to the 12, but, but it's a group name now. But the word disciple or apostle is reserved for them. If we use it in a different sense, one who is being sent, we would think of it as a missionary, one who is sent from a church or an organization. But even more so, now that we are discovering the power of being missional, what that means, we are the ones who are sent. We are the apostles, small a, if you will, being sent. So here's what Jesus says. Uh, here's what it says. Verse 13, Mark chapter 3. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. Now, pick that apart for a moment because it could be misunderstood. In other, uh, the other Gospels, we find that Jesus has just spent all night in prayer. It's not that he went up the mountainside and then called people and they left. He has spent all night in prayer, discerning from his Father whom he should call as those who would be sent out. We will note from this crowd, there will be what we call the 12 apostles, but there will be 70 other people chosen to follow him in his ministry. And so later on, when Judas Iscariot is no longer part of the band, they replace him with one who had been with Jesus from the very beginning. And uh, you know the story, it's found in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 1. And uh, notice it says he called to them those he wanted. Now, careful, because it sounds like, what, did Jesus not want certain people? That's not what Jesus says. You'll remember in the scriptures, Jesus says, to everyone, come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. He talks constantly about anyone who comes to him, he will by no means cast aside. So the word and term that's used here is not so much wanted as opposed to not wanted. Those whom he willed to be his apostles because he had heard the Father speaking to him through the Spirit all night long and now he was ready to choose them for this mission. He appointed 12, verse 14, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Apostolos, send them out. To preach. Now, he's going to give them more than just preaching with their mouth. They're going to be living examples of what the kingdom looks like. That's what we are to do as well as being sent out by Jesus to show people what the kingdom looks like. But he also, what we note is uh, that um, they're also going to have authority over the dark powers, over the demons. All of darkness now will shudder and tremble because he puts his authority upon them. L later on tonight, I'm going to talk about the authority that's given to you and to me. We don't understand it, and I hope we do. Because one of the things about the church throughout history is it's in some ways failed to grasp the authority that we have from Jesus himself. He says to his disciples, meaning to us as well, greater things, melon is the Greek word, greater things will you do than I did because I go to the Father. Now, it doesn't mean greater by quality. It means greater in number. And we are to live like Jesus did with the power and the authority of the heavens. Um, but he gave them the power to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. So you'll find the list here. You'll find them in the Gospels, all four Gospels. Uh, but they're different. And I want to go through the difference very briefly before we move on. Shimon, Simon, to whom he gave the name Petra, Peter. Simon is a very Jewish name. He gives him the nickname The Rock. to give good nicknames to people, not, not derogatory ones. What would he call you? What would his nickname be for you? To James and John, they'll be the sons of thunder, and we get a little bit of glimpse into their lives when later on they want to call down fire from heaven to destroy people who are not following Jesus. Jesus says, you have no idea the power from which you're, of which you're speaking. In. But he calls them the sons of thunder. It sounds like a wrestling team, James and John. Uh, which means the sons of the, in verse 18, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Those are the 12. Now, let me unpack those for just uh, a moment, because if you look at the different lists, you think, well, wait a minute, there's a couple other names that are used, and these names don't appear. They're the same 12. But what we find out, uh, by the way, oh, by the way, funny story, it's true, I saw this going around on the internet, where people had said, oh, you can't trust the Bible because do you really think Jesus would have disciples named Peter, Andrew, Philip, uh, Thomas, James, as if to imply that these are 21st century names. Friends, these are Hebrew and Aramaic names 
that we have taken from them. And Greek names, Philip is a Greek name, Philip and Mastodon, the great hero in the ancient world, you'll remember. But these are names that are in the Middle East and they're very ancient. You know, they, they mean something. Um, Matthew, uh, we looked at before when he called the tax collector Levi or Levi, that, that his name is known as, we now call him Matthew, which means gift of God in Hebrew. Or, or uh, we'll find James. James is an ancient word. It's an ancient uh, Hebrew word, but it had, goes through Celtic even later on. Hamish is, is, is translated um, in different ways. Uh, but James is a very Hebrew name. Uh, Simon the Zealot. Judas Iscariot. Um, but let's take a look at two of them. Bartholomew. Bartholomew is only found in, in, um, in the lists of the four Gospels. And so you wonder, well, who was he? Because we don't hear much of him in the Gospels. Bartholomew, I believe there's good reason to say this is Nathaniel. So if you know the name Nathaniel, that's Bartholomew. Uh, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, in Greek means, uh, in Hebrew means son of Ptolemyo. That's not his name, that's his title. Same as Bartimaeus, the blind man you'll see later on. Poor guy didn't even have a name, his name is son of Timaeus. But Bartholomew, the son of Ptolemyo, uh, I think is Nathaniel. And, and there's good reason because of his, the, the, the way, the placement in the list of the 12. And if that's Nathaniel, notice this, John chapter 1. Jesus speaks to him and Nathaniel says, Oh my gosh, you are the son of God. You're, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, you believe me? Because I said, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you remember that phrase? That is, I saw you under the fig tree was an ancient idiom for rabbis. Is it possible that Nathaniel was a rabbi who became a follower of Jesus and became one of the disciples of Jesus, yet he is a rabbi himself? I think so. So that's Bartholomew. Find him in John chapter 1, um, Nathaniel. The other word that's used here is Thaddeus. He's only mentioned two times in the New Testament. And what we find about Thaddeus is that I believe it, he's the other Judas, the good Judas, not the bad Judas. He is, you'll find in John chapter 14, Thaddeus asks a question, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Thaddeus, uh, Judas asks a question, and I believe that's the Thaddeus mentioned here. So keep in mind the list. It might seem very boring to you as we go through them, but I think it's important to know who they are, to know their stories and where they come from and, and uh, where they were going, because you're going to meet them one day. And these are now the 12. By the way, one of the things that Jesus did, note this. And you see this in John 1 especially. Jesus came to make the new Israel. You, you might know in Israel they have the 12 tribes. With Out of the 12 tribes come the 71 leaders that are known as the Sanhedrin. Jesus comes along, selects 12 people. These are to replace the 12 tribes and then collects around him 72 disciples, one more than the Sanhedrin. Isn't that amazing? So it's, I think it's a clear indication Jesus is going to rebuild Israel the way it was supposed to be in holiness, not as a nation like other nations, but the holy covenant people of God. So, all right, enough about that. I uh, hope that was informative. Uh, hopefully you have some comments on that. I want to go on and on with some of this because you know I like to study languages and see how it all fits together. Um, that's my heart. But uh, Oh, one final thing, Judas Iscariot. People often ask, why is he called Judas Iscariot? And there are three different reasons for this, and nobody really knows. Depends on which author you read. It could be Judas from Kiriath. It's a city, an ancient village. The problem is archaeologists have never found so-and-so of Kiriath as a title. So Judas Iscariot. Iscariot could also be translated in some ways dagger bearer. He may have been a zealot. The problem is people have written books on, well, he was the zealot trying to force Jesus' hand. I, I don't think that works, to be honest with you. Love to dialogue with that. I, there's another word that's used in an Aramaic term, Kiriath. Uh, it, the term uh, Iscariot could mean the false one. I think that's why the disciples referred to him as Judas, the false one. And so anyway, those are my thoughts. Verse, 29, uh, verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house. And again, a crowd gathered. There's the theme. Always happens. So that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. That's how they were pressing in on him. They couldn't even eat their food. Now, Jesus is used to this, and he'll be used to it in those years. Remember, Jesus got away from the crowds. But he was never frustrated with the crowds. In fact, his heart was 
filled with emotion and compassion on the crowds as people without a shepherd, sheep without a shepherd. He wanted to take care of them. But I think the disciples probably got very frustrated. They could never finish a meal when Jesus was around because the crowds came and pressed on him. When his family heard about this, they went out to take charge of him. For they said, he's out of his mind. Sometimes we miss that in the scriptures. Here is Jesus who is, we know, the, the great story in Luke chapter 1 and 2 and, and about how he is the Son of God, and Mary knows this. But there's a moment in his ministry, you know, life goes on, and she knows her son, and she knows he is a, a savior, but I don't even think Mary quite got it. She, she, she wanted to go with the other children and say he's, he's losing it. The poor guy is not getting a rest. Look at the crowds pressing around him. The religious authorities are threatening him. He's out of his mind. We've got to get some rest for him. And so they came to give him rest. We're going to jump ahead because in between this past, these verses and other verses, we're going to get back to uh, a dialogue I think is placed better this way for our dialogue and in interpreting the Bible. But notice what we have is, uh, that's verses 20 through 21. Verses 34 to 35, read that with me if you will. Um, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrive standing outside. They send someone in to call him. They think he's out of his mind. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Hey, Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And then Jesus says these words, Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. I want you to hear this because what he's about to say is he's interpreting who you and I are. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Isn't that powerful? What we notice about Jesus is this. Yes, he loved his mother. I think the relationship Mary and Jesus had was, was the greatest relationship the world has ever known. As, as, a, as a complete man of God, Jesus himself, the perfect individual. And he is the perfect individual. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. He is without sin. He is the example of who we are to be, what God intended for us to be as God's children before sin entered the world. He is the prototokos in the Greek, the first fruit of the harvest. He is the, the second Adam that Paul will call him in 1 Corinthians 15. He is the one who shows us who we are supposed to be as Adam, as clay, humans. And so, see, I'm getting on tangents now. But I want you to notice this. Jesus is saying, who is my brother and my mother? Those who what? Do the will of God. There again we see this idea that Jesus came to build community. Community, fellowship. Of all those who love God and want to follow God. And so we find that there. And, and um, I think that's a very powerful statement by Jesus. I hope you do too. Because friends, I know you want to do the will of God. I do with all my heart. Sometimes my heart gets in the way. No, no, I take it back. Oftentimes my heart and my sin gets in the way. But... We want to do the will of God. Jesus calls you brother, sister, mother. Um, the beautiful relationships that we share in family mean that we belong to the community called the church. And if you've been joining with us Sunday mornings, we're defining what the church is by looking at different terms and what we are to be. All right. I wanted to finish that up so we can get back to the real heart of the matter of now Jesus' critics come to him. And what they're about to say to him is the most evil thing someone can say. Follow along with me. And the teachers of the law, verse 22, who came down from Jerusalem said, before I say what he has said, whenever you read in the Bible, came down from Jerusalem, that's always the term. You can go north, south, east, or west. You're going down from Jerusalem because you always go up to Jerusalem, which is the holy city of God. You never say, let's go down to Jerusalem, even if you're going south. You always go, let's go up to Jerusalem. So just want to point that out. This doesn't really tell us where we are in Israel at this point, but Jesus is in a house and the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem and said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Again, I like language. I don't like the words they're using here because what we find out is there is an etymology of the word uh, that has now happened in the first century. It's, it's in, in the ancient of days, people tried to figure out what, what was our relationship between good and evil. Don't we try to figure that out? 
What is theodicy? Why does evil thing? Why do evil things happen? Uh, and and that's uh, something I don't think anyone really understands. And we'll understand it one day when we stand in the kingdom. Why do bad things happen? But we do know that there is dark. There are dark influences. When Cain was about to kill Abel, God intervened. Genesis four, and He said to Cain, Cain, look if. You're jealous of your brother. I'm paraphrasing here. If you do what is right, things will be well. But if you don't do what is right, literally translated from the Canaanite, we have it different from the Hebrew. It says, there's a demon ready to pounce on you. You must master it. Now, what we find out in our life is this. Every one of us has to master something. We all have sins. They may be different. They may be the same. But if we don't master that sin, it will master us and it will destroy us. Here's what I want to say about the devil himself. He is insidious. First of all, the word in the ancient language, one of the first books of the Bible chronologically, not you know, listed in the books is Job. In the book of Job, we find that there is this one in heaven who stands in the court of heaven and he accuses people. Oh yeah, God, you're happy with Job, your servant? Well, I can break him. How can you be pleased for what he's going to do? This, he's called the accuser. And the word accuser in the ancient language, in the Middle Eastern language, is shaitan. Um, the word in Hebrew, there was a great teacher called Maimonides, uh, Moshe Maimonides in the 12th century. He's great Jewish, brilliant Jewish scholar. Much of Judaism today is, um, depends on his teaching. He said the word Satan in Hebrew actually means the one who tries to drive us off the path. That's what Satan means. Now, how you feel, but friends, I happen to believe there is a character named Satan. We call him the devil, um, Shaitan, the accuser. He loves to whisper in your ear and mind, you're no good. Who do you think you are? You, you, you'll never amount to anything. He tries to get us off the track of God's love. And uh, he does a, an insidious and, and uh, terrible job. Jesus didn't think it was cute. He didn't kind of snicker at, at a devil with pitchforks in the tail and say, oh yeah, it's just a caricature. Jesus called him a murderer from the beginning because Jesus knew that this character was out there to drive us off the path to insult God and God's glory. And he doesn't care for you. And be careful about the, the promises he gives to you. He's insidious. Let me tell you how insidious. There's an ancient story in Haiti and the story is about a man who wanted to buy another man's home. It was a very small home, a bungalow. And he went to the owner. He said, I want to buy the home. And uh, how much is it? And the owner gave him a price, but it was more than the man could afford. He says, I, I can't afford it, but I really want your house. How? And then the, the owner said, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you the house for free. You can have it. And I said, this is terrific. And so he entered the house. And the man said, but here's the deal. I want one nail that still belongs to me. And I said, Sure. Why not? One nail. Who cares? He says, I want that nail right above the front door. That's fine. It's yours. But the rest of the house is mine, right? Absolutely. Okay. Good deal. A couple years later, as the man was enjoying his free house, knowing that one nail above the door didn't belong to him, the original owner came back. He says, look, I want to buy the house back again. The owner said, no way. You sold it to me. I'm going to keep it. I'm not selling it back. And the owner said, well, fair enough. I, I did tell you that I'd own this one nail. And he went out. And he found dead carcasses. Well, I guess all carcasses are dead. Took a carcasses and began to hang the carcasses above the front door on that one nail that he owned until that man could no longer stay in his house and had to leave. That's what the devil does to us. If we are not passionately objected to, to everything he does, he's going to have that one nail in your life, in my life, where he hangs the dead carcasses. And before long, you and I will, because of the stench, not be able to support ourselves anymore. He came. He's a murderer. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, you know, Jesus came to build us a home. And what we find out in the home that Jesus came to build us is that uh, it's supposed to be a palace. C.S. Lewis, I was reading um, C.S. Lewis a little bit. Oh, Debbie's saying there's no video. That's all. Oh, it's old. Okay, I'm always coming to the party late. Yeah, All right. Don't look at your phone. Yeah, well, I have to look at my phone for this quote. So here we go. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says these beautiful words. Listen to them. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. 
He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. He's throwing out a new wing here, putting up an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. But Jesus is building himself a palace. He intends to come and live in him, in it himself with you. And I think that's important for us to know. So why are we leaving nails around for the devil to hang things on, right? Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his Gulag letters talks about uh, evil in this way. He says, you know, it'd be so much easier if we could just separate the good people from the bad people. Put the bad people over there and the good people over there. But the more we observe, we realize that the good and the bad are not in the people. They're in our hearts. And in order to get rid of the bad, we have to do some work on our hearts and cut pieces off. But none of us want to destroy our hearts. So we leave it alone and pretend it's okay. And I think he's right. This is, what we, this is the temptation for us, is not to address the evil that's in us. Friend, if you have a nail hanging out there for the devil, you've you got to take it out. You've got you to gotta give it to the true owner who is Jesus because he wants to build you in a palace. Uh, screw tape letters, one more illustration that we'll get in the text. Uh, if you haven't read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I, I put it on your bucket list. It's a profound book in which C.S. Lewis talks about, uh, it's a fictional story, of course, about uh, a demon, a devil named Screwtape, who is trying to help his nephew, Wormwood, uh, destroy a man who, who is called the patient in the book. And throughout the book, uh, Wormwood tries everything he can. He tries to put evil out there, but the man just, he recognizes that it's evil. Finally, Screwtape and Wormwood come up with a plan. They said, what we'll do is we'll just make him compromise a little bit in his life. And once he compromises a little bit, it'll be more compromise and more compromise until he's eternally damned. Now, I won't tell you the end of the book. I want you to read it. Um, it's, it's a brilliant book by C.S. Lewis, but he talks about the insidious character of the devil. So who is this devil? Well, as I mentioned, Shaitan, Satan, the accuser, um, we find a lot of literature and a lot of uh, input from the Sumerians, the ancient, 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 ancient culture of the Sumerians, the Canaanites who had their own words. The Canaanites used a word called Baal. You'll have heard that in the Old Testament. Baal in Hebrew means master. And by the time of Jesus, they had come up with a demon or that would be called the prince of the demons named Baal Zabub means flies, the lord of the flies. You can see the image there of, of death and decay and, and um, maggots and everything because that's what happens in death. You know, before long, you see the maggots and the flies. And so imagine what they're about to call Jesus, the Lord of decay and the flies. Here's what Jesus says. I've lost my place. Here we go. Verse 22, the teacher of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by his Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Jesus called them over to him. Notice that. This is a conversation. Jesus often walked away from conversations because they were petty and silly. This drew Jesus' attention. He called them over to him. As if he said, it's a come to Jesus <laughs> uh, conversation for sure. He began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes, opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Here's what Jesus is saying. Are you kidding me? This is a come to Jesus moment. Come here. And as the religious leaders came over, he says, I want to tell you something. It's a truth that they knew. It's a truth that, that if this truth isn't real, then, then there's no hope for us. Let me explain what I mean by that. If Jesus did good things in order to trick the people, and he is the devil himself, or the prince of the devil, friends, you and I have no hope because that's mental. Jesus says, look, look around you. You know from the example, a division always causes destruction. You've seen this. I've seen this plenty of times as even a pastor. That a marriage, 
Husband and wife begin getting at each other's throats or, 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 or yelling at each other or cursing each other. And before long, what happens? They're not far from divorce. Once we turn upon one another, there's no good that thing that comes from it. Jesus is making that eternal principle, saying, you know this. If I cast out demons, and I'm doing this in opposition to the devil himself, how could I be on his side? A house divided will not stand. Abraham Lincoln used that, remember? A house divided, Abraham Lincoln quoted the Bible often. Um, it's just profound with Lincoln's words. You even you read his second emancipation uh, no, I'm sorry, his second uh, inaugural address is, there are so many quotes from the Bible that it's, 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 it's amazing. Lincoln knew his Bible. But he quotes this, a house divided against itself shall not stand. And that was one of the impetus for him to make sure that the nation would not divide itself. Um, besides slavery, which is the big issue, of course. But here's what Jesus is saying. I have to plunder him. But notice what he says. He can only cast out demons if he is the strong man who binds up the strong man. In other words, what does that tell us about Jesus? He's greater than Satan. I'm sorry, Jesus and Satan are not brothers. Jesus is the creator of all things. And he has power over Satan himself. In fact, the devil trembles because of the Holy One of Israel. Now the leaders have done something very demonic themselves and evil themselves. They have held up ritual. And if Jesus didn't obey by their ritual... He must be from the devil. But remember again what I said. Jesus, who loved ritual, didn't like ritual that tied people up. And so he did relationships. And when he freed people up, they were truly free because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And what we find out here is that Jesus is now going to say something that we need to interpret and unpack because people have misunderstood this. So follow along with me, verse 28. Truly I tell you, the word for truly in Greek, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. They can be forgiven of all sins. We know that. All sins can be forgiven. That's why we plead with people. Don't hold on to your sins. Give them to Jesus. Put them there on the cross. He wants to take them away. Why are you still holding on to them? All sins can be forgiven in every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Yes, there is a sin that is eternal that will keep people from God's presence. Blasphemy. Now, that doesn't mean blasphemy by, by, by calling God a name. You know, people have done that. They can still be saved. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemos in the Greek. The word blasphemy means to go against what God is doing. God does something great and you call it evil. Well, you end up in a terrible situation because you're calling God evil. And when you resist the work of God, that is the sin that can't be forgiven. Friends, think about it for a moment. If Jesus came to save us of our sins and we don't follow the Spirit in coming to Jesus, our sins aren't, we can't be forgiven. Does that make sense? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and, and notice it's put in a futuristic tense. Uh, well, maybe you don't notice that, but it's in the future. Those who continue in the blasphemy, who fight against and reject what God is doing, because God is good and God came, us to give, came to give us the gift of salvation for anyone who would receive. If you reject that, you call God evil. I don't know where you go from there. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit means the work of the Spirit and what the Spirit is doing. People, all, uh, people have called me time and time again and said, Pastor, have I committed the unpardonable sin? The answer is no. You have not. All sins can be forgiven. But if you continue to reject the work of God's salvation, I don't know where you're left. I don't know what you have left. God came to give us grace. Receive it, friends, because we can be with God forever. Not just now, but forever. It's the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Powerful. But here's, here's what Jesus was telling the religious leaders. You are opposing the work of God, and now you're calling me the devil. How could I be the devil if I'm destroying his work? And that's what Jesus came to do. Mark, John Mark, through Peter's own eyes, wants you to know Jesus came to set things right. Do you need something set right in your life tonight? Do you have relationships that have gone haywire, divided, division, fighting, antagonism? Is your body 
And we talked about other people we prayed for. Is your body not cooperating with you? And, and maybe even terrible ways. Are your emotions? Have you been listening to the whisperings of the evil one rather than words of God who says, you are my child, you're beloved. Then you need to be healed. You need to be restored. And that's what Jesus wants for us. Don't continue in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit by rejecting what the Holy Spirit is doing. I want to share a story. I know our time is up or almost up, and um, but we're going to end here in a moment. Years ago, in my early 20s, I had a person who I got to know was a young man himself, and we talked about things. And he came from a non-religious background, and uh, he, he and I talked for a long time, and I prayed with him. He asked about Jesus. We talked about him, and one day I said to him, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. Would you allow him to come into your life? And he said, yeah, I want that. And, and so we prayed together. He, he, he accepted Christ. And I had no idea what was going to be unleashed after that. Because his family found out that he had uh, now wanted to go to church. Harmless enough. He wanted to go to church. He wanted to be a part of this beautiful thing that he experienced. This, this, this community that, as he got around friends, but they didn't understand what he had done and said he joined a cult. And I, and I said to him, I'm not making you do anything. You do whatever you want to do. I mean, there's no... You know, I just want you to read God's word and come to know him. And after a while, his family, who didn't have anything against Jesus, they began to tell him that Jesus was evil. And I remember in those days, my heart breaking because he soon listened to them. And he, they had him so fooled. And, and my heart broke for him. He actually came to me one day and said, Ross, I, I don't want any part of this anymore. I said, I don't know what you want a part of. It's just the Bible and the scriptures and God. And uh, his family had convinced him that Jesus was really the devil and that he was trying to trick him into serving him. And you know, it got to the point where I finally said to him, you have the choice to do whatever you want. I'll be praying for you that, you know, because God is good. You just don't know God's goodness. And if you constantly believe that Jesus is the devil or that God is out to trick you, I don't know how to, how to convince you otherwise. The linchpin is this, and I believe this with all my heart. God is good, and God loves you, and God wants to bless your life, not curse your life. Who told you that? God didn't come to curse your life. God came to set you free, and God loves you more than you can ever begin to understand, and, and, if, and if you'll start playing the mental games about what God is doing to try and trick you, I can't convince you otherwise. But I know from experience that if you give your life to Christ and you open your life to God's presence, God wants to bless your life in every way. And you will receive a love that, 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 is, that is eternal. God is love. And the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit says God's playing tricks. God's not playing tricks. What is faith? John Calvin said it. A sure and certain knowledge of the benevolence of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I'm going to butcher this quote, but, but convinced in our hearts and sealed in our minds, whatever it is. It's God's goodness. God is good, and God wants to bless your life. Those words changed my life one day when I heard someone say that simple phrase, who told you God wants to curse you? God wants to bless you. Changed my life. I realized, oh yeah, you're right. That is actually the principle that all things hang on. Jesus is good and he loves you. All right, finish up this chapter real quickly. So we'll get to chapter four next week. He said this, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, because they were saying he has an impure spirit. And that ends the text because we already looked around uh, at the ending by skipping there. The chapter three, God bless you, friends. I think that, uh, that uh, um, God wants to bless your life. Again, if you want to put a comment in the sections, please do email me, um, call me, whatever. If there's something you're struggling with, let's, let's communicate, let's talk, because it is my passion, my driving force, because I'm learning it myself, that God's love, God, God wants to love us and bless us. Before I go tonight, and I'll end in prayer, against, uh, again, a reminder, Dave and Carol and Leslie celebrating 65-year anniversary tonight, today, and this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, come in their car, drive by, and just wave to them and give them a great greeting, that uh, happy anniversary, 65 years. By the way, Dave and Carol, and so patriarchs and matriarch of this church, together they have served this church for well over 100 years. Well, not individually, but together. Uh, back in the 50s. Carolyn Bewley, that's Carolyn Leslie, uh, her father used to be the pastor here, Chet Bewley, uh, for many years. Uh, and we're just very grateful for the work that he did in the family. The Leslie family is just wonderful. 
What more can I say? You tell them that on Saturday. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you so much for your word, which is good and true and how much you love us. We pray as we leave tonight, Lord, that you would remind us that you have given us the power as your apostles, your apostolos, those being sent out. And Lord, we would not just kind of shy away in our faith, but we'd live it boldly for you, giving you every piece of our house, our lives. Not one nail belongs to the devil. It all belongs to you, Jesus. Come and make your home. Live in us and through us so that we can be built in the palaces that you intend us to be. Thank you for tonight. Bless us as we go our way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining with us. We'll see you on Sunday.